It was a rancid summer Friday in 1922 on the Lower East Side of Manhattan. It was barely past noon, and as usual, the bustling slum was a beehive of activity. Kosher butchers were hanging up great slabs of meat. Shop owners, peddlers, and dealers of all sorts were tending to their wares and helping customers. Children were playing. In the midst of this hubbub, three men were standing stationary on the corner of East 12th and 2nd Avenue, waiting. The men stood out. They were much more well-dressed than anyone else on the street. And despite the solidly Jewish character of the neighborhood, these guys, with their dark features, were all obviously Southern Italian. Suddenly, another group of Italians appeared from around the corner, led by the 25-year-old Lucky Luciano. The first group of Italians recognized Lucky's group, like they were expecting them. However, as Lucky and his boys crossed the street and closed on the other group of Italians, they all pulled out handguns and opened fire. Their victims had their own guns and fired back wildly. Both groups scattered, shooting indiscriminately. Women screamed, teenagers gawked, a little girl got hit in the chest. A street sweeper caught a bullet in the leg. One of Lucky's targets saw a passing taxi and took his chance to escape. He daringly jumped on the running board and took off, firing backwards at his attackers. With their enemies scattering, innocents on the ground, and the police on their way, most of Lucky's crew took off running. Not Lucky, though. He had a job to do. He sprinted to the middle of the street, took aim at the fleeing Sicilian, and emptied his gun, hitting his prey in the chest, killing him. His job well done, Lucky ducked into the Lower East Side alleys he knew so well, and disappeared. By 1920, both Meyer Lansky and Lucky Luciano had formidable street crews and were moving from teenage gangbangers to grown-up, sophisticated career criminals. According to the scattered information available to us, it seems they ran gambling games, provided muscle for labor unions, sold heroin, loan sharks, and extorted smaller criminals for the right to get money in their neighborhood. They were still living in the hood and had a lot of room to grow, but were quickly becoming the guys to talk to if you wanted to make money on the Lower East Side. Meyer set up shop in a private room of Ratner's Kosher Deli on Delancey Street. By this time, he had developed a solid gang of tough Jewish guys that he grew up with. The most formidable of these gangsters was Benny Bugsy Siegel. A few years younger than Meyer, Bugsy was so named because he was bugged out, crazy as a bed bug. While he was a good money maker, he was mainly known for his extreme temper and eagerness to use violence. Meyer's group was known on the street as the Bugs Meyer Mob. Lucky for his part had his own crew of Italian wise guys, which included many future Cosa Nostra leaders. Meyer and Lucky were by this time bound by a close personal friendship and a mutual professional respect and their gangs often acted in a conjunction, and this coalition dominated the streets in southeastern Manhattan. However, New York is a big place, and while infighting and police investigations had largely decimated 19th century gangs like the Five Points Organization, at the dawn of Prohibition, the city was filled with a dizzying array of various gangsters, mobs, and crews cooperating and competing in order to squeeze profits out of the slums. In the Bronx, a psychotic Jewish thug known as Dutch Schultz was working his way up the local criminal ladder, from stick-up kid to brothel bouncer to gang manager through his trademark brutal violence. In West Harlem, which at this point was the main predominantly black neighborhood in the city, African-American gangsters, including most prominently a mysterious Caribbean woman known as Madame St. Clair, were involved in a number of sophisticated criminal schemes, especially a form of a legal lottery known as the Number. Irish gangs ran the solidly Irish slum known as Hell's Kitchen on the west side of Manhattan, and a different Irish gang, known as the White Hand, was in the process of losing a brutal, racialized conflict with Italian groups for control of the Brooklyn waterfront. However, by 1920, two underworld kingpins soared over the rest in terms of ambition, scope, and power. These two men, one Italian and one Jewish, loathed each other, had diametrically opposed personal styles and business practices. However, they both took Meyer and Lucky under their wings and directly contributed to their later development of La Cosa Nostra. The first of these men, 
the Italian, was a loud, obese, old-school Sicilian named Joe Masseria. Masseria had been spending the last two decades importing traditional, explicitly feudal organizing principles and norms from the old country. Before World War I, very few of the millions of Southern Italian immigrants pouring into America were actually members of Mafia clans. Within Sicily, members of Mafia clans openly contracted with the government, economic elites, and Catholic Church in order to provide order, were relatively well off, and almost constituted a warrior elite. Thus, being relatively comfortable in their homeland, they saw no reason to leave. Before 1915 or so, the vast majority of Italian immigrants were like Lucky Luciano's family. They were certainly familiar with the Mafia, and perhaps shared the warrior ethic promoted by Mafia groups, but they were not organizationally involved. Joe Masseria was a decade older than Lucky, but had a similarly mundane background. An unaffiliated tailor in Sicily, Masseria immigrated to the U.S. in 1902 when he was around 16 fleeing a murder charge. He quickly dropped his honest trade and joined a gang of Italians that operated out of southern Manhattan and the heavily Italian East Harlem. Masseria, who by all accounts was crude, uncouth, and not particularly intelligent, spent the next 20 years murdering his way to the top of the Italian-American underworld. In the early 20th century, his group was especially known for the so-called barrel murders. A crude but effective tactic to get rid of bodies, Masseria and his goons would murder a man, stuff his body into a wooden barrel, and either throw him to the river, leave it on a street corner, or mail it to a fake address out of town. Dozens of young Italian men were found in barrels around the New York area in this period, most of them murdered by Masseria's group. By 1920, the corpulent Masseria was known for his huge appetites, terrible table manners, and arrogance. He typically ate several huge meals a day and often wore fancy clothes stained with pasta sauce. He was also very old school, and despite his plebeian background in Sicily, he operated like he was running an established mafia clan back in the old country. He preferred to only work with Sicilians. He set up an explicit ranked hierarchy loosely based on the old feudal order. And most importantly, he was motivated by a desire to be recognized as a community leader rather than just an appetite for profit. By the 1920s, he was referring to himself as the boss of all the Italian groups operating in Manhattan and beyond. His enemies, less taken with his aristocratic pretensions, referred to him as Joe the Glutton and called him a pig and a peasant. Despite his less admirable qualities, Masseria did have an eye for talent. And while an ugly anti-Semitic streak prevented him from working with Jewish gangsters, he avidly recruited young Italian hustlers to do dirt for him and protect his rackets. Not surprisingly, Lucky Luciano was associated with the Masseria organization, running Masseria's concerns in southern Manhattan. Through this affiliation, Luciano met other promising up-and-coming Italian street guys. Despite Masseria's hunger for power, vulgar personal habits, and xenophobic inability to work with non-Italians. By 1920, his organization steadily gained control over criminal enterprises and protection rackets in Italian communities from Harlem to the southern tip of Manhattan. The second elder criminal who had influenced Lucky, Meyer, and the development of La Cosa Nostra was a Jewish mobster named Arnold Rothstein. Around the same age as Masseria, Rothstein was the opposite in nearly every way. Unlike virtually every other person we'll talk about in this series, Arnold Rothstein was both born in America and raised in a wealthy environment. His father was a religious Jew and a successful businessman who was known for his upright conduct and respect for law and order. Arnold's father wanted him to follow in his footsteps as a devout, law-abiding businessman, but this was not to be. One of Arnold's earliest memories was of skipping Hebrew school to gamble with other kids for their candy. He spent his formative years on the street and in dive bars, shooting pool, gambling, and gathering a diverse group of friends and associates that included scions of elite families and fearsome street criminals. By the time Arnold Rothstein was a young man, he decided that his money would have a better return if invested in criminal rather than legitimate business. 
Rothstein was an avid gambler, so in f- his first investments were in gambling. These were wildly successful, and he quickly expanded into other activities, and most importantly, ended up acting as a bank for a whole generation of ambitious, up-and-coming young hustlers. If Masseria was trying to bring rigid, old country tradition to the streets of New York, Rothstein was attempting to run his criminal enterprises on the flexible, entrepreneurial principles of modern capitalism. When dealing with younger criminals, he didn't want slavish of deference or tribute. He just wanted a decent return on investment. Rather than operating like a king or a big boss, he was more of an angel investor, providing capital and advice. Rothstein not only eschewed the rigid, hierarchical organization of the Italians, he also had no time for the bigoted tribalism that defined so many gangsters. Rothstein was born in New York and saw all New Yorkers as his people. He was especially successful at using his charisma and money to ingratiate himself with the largely Protestant and Irish political establishment in order to safeguard his rackets and those of his partners. Dressed in subdued but expensive suits from the hippest boutiques, Rothstein carried himself like a fashionable member of the blue-blooded New York elite and unlike most Jews, was generally welcome at high society events, where he built relationships with high-ranking police and politicians, further ingratiating them with bribes, women, and a good time. Rothstein was equally comfortable in the slums, and despite maintaining a fashionable office on West 57th Street for his extensive legitimate businesses, he would usually be found on corners around Manhattan flanked by an army of bodyguards, collecting debts, making deals, and mentoring a whole new generation of gangsters from across the city. His cosmopolitan outlook meant that he was able to work well with hustlers of any ethnicity, and by 1920 he had a vast network of criminal associates of various backgrounds getting money with him. On the street, Rothstein was known as Mr. Big and the Brain. Rothstein's lawyer, a longtime friend, William Fallon, described Rothstein as a man who dwells in doorways, a gray rat waiting for his cheese. Despite their differences, before Prohibition, Masari and Rothstein, the gluttonous pig and the gray rat were involved in similar criminal activities. First of all, there were various protection rackets, and both legit businessmen and small-time criminals paid taxes for the right to do business in gang-controlled areas. There was labor racketeering as well. Vicious labor disputes shook the entire United States during this era, and in New York, the bourgeoisie could rely on both the police and militarized mercenaries to violently disrupt labor action. To counteract this, unionists turned to gang members, who for a price would act as muscle for the labor unions. Using this toehold, gangs often infiltrated unions, muscled into leadership roles, and subverted them into engines of profit, looting union relief funds and demanding bribes from business owners in exchange for labor peace. Finally, and most importantly, there was nightlife. Vices, big and small, to entertain after work. For working-class New Yorkers, there were corner dice games, pool halls, low-rent brothels, and heroin. For the richer set, there were beautiful casinos, floating high-stakes card games, high-end bordellos, and cocaine. Closely connected to this was loan sharking, and if you needed an extra few bucks to make another bet, buy another bag, or keep a prostitute's attention, both Masseria and Rothstein's organizations would be happy to lend you some money. You would just have to be comfortable with usurious interest rates and using your body as collateral. These schemes were profitable, and by the 1920 passage of Prohibition, both Rothstein and Masseria were rich men. However, Prohibition was going to unleash a storm of violence and profit unlike anything New York had ever seen. Both Masseria and Rothstein were going to see a lot of this money, and both would die violently before Prohibition ended. In 1920, the feds banned the sale and transport of alcohol, and the legal supply of liquor disappeared overnight, but demand remained strong. This provided innumerable opportunities for young thugs like Meyer and Lucky, and older gangsters like Masseria and Rothstein. Liquor had to be covertly manufactured or smuggled into the country, 
loads of liquor had to be moved and it had to be distributed through illegal speakeasies where thirsty customers would pay a premium for the newly contraband booze. With all this valuable product and money moving around and changing hands, none of the entrepreneurs involved could go to the cops if they were robbed or assaulted. All of this was great for organized crime. The fact that New York City and state were controlled by Irish Catholic politicians who opposed prohibition usually enjoyed a stiff drink themselves, and that the law was seldom seriously enforced in the city. Much like marijuana in the early 21st century, this mismatch between social attitudes, state policy, and federal law led to a relatively low-risk, high-reward criminal opportunity. Rothstein and Masseria got involved in nearly every aspect of the new liquor trade and needed young toughs to protect their investments and disrupt those of their enemies. Lucky continued his partnership with Joe the Boss Masseria and ran his speakeasies on the Lower East Side in an increasingly profitable arrangement. He also provided muscle for Masseria and committed his first semi-confirmed murder in his service. Being teenage gang members from the brutal streets of the Lower East Side, Meyer and Lucky were no strangers to violence, and it is likely, or at least plausible, that both men had already killed before Prohibition, although there's no evidence of this. In any case, this was about to change for both men. By August 1922, Masseria's success and arrogance has, had caused a rival group of Italian gangsters to try and kill him. A team of killers, led by a mass-murdering immigrant named Umberto Valente, ambushed Masseria outside his Lower East Side brownstone. While the hitmen unloaded their guns at close range and hit eight innocent bystanders, the portly Masseria was able to scamper away, unharmed but extremely shaken. If the broad consensus is correct, three days later, Lucky Luciano solved the boss's problem permanently. Around noon, a team of Masseria's men probably led by Lucky, ambushed Masseria's would-be assassin, Umberto Valenti, on a street corner in the Lower East Side. Valenti had already killed around 20 men at this point, and he was ready, opening fire on Lucky and his hit team when he saw them. A brutal, chaotic shootout followed. An eight-year-old girl got hit in the chest, then an innocent street cleaner caught a bullet. Desperate for a way out, Valenti jumped on the running board of a passing taxi cab shooting wildly at his attackers from the moving car. According to witness reports, Lucky strode into the middle of the street and returned fire. According to a teenage witness, it was the coolest thing I ever saw. People were shrieking and running in all directions, and this fellow calmly fired shot after shot. He did not move until he had emptied his weapon. One of the bullets hit Valenti in the chest, killing him, avenging the assassination attempt and solidifying Lucky Luciano's prominence in Masseria's organization. While Lucky was moving up the rigid ranks of nascent Italian organized crime, his close alliance with the Bugs Meyer mob always hurt him with the old school Sicilians. Masseria, like many Catholics of his generation, held an inherent hatred of Jews, could never really trust an Italian who worked so closely with them. Masseria's hatred of Jews not, not only it was offensive to Lucky's values, it was also a major impediment to making money in the diverse city. Later, in an interview, Lucky referred to Masseria as a greasy old gavon, using a Sicilian slur for dumb peasant. Lucky wasn't quite ready to rock the boat, but his loyalty was firmly with his Jewish homeboys, not the out-of-touch, arrogant Masseria. In any case, they were about to meet an even better criminal mentor. Around 1920, Meyer Lansky met Arnold Rothstein, that gray rat, at the bar mitzvah of a mutual friend's son. Rothstein took an instant liking to the younger man and invited Meyer to dinner, meeting him at the swanky Park Central Hotel. With their shared religion, neighborhood of origin, and preternatural abilities in math, it's likely that Rothstein saw himself in the younger gangster. Decades later, Meyer remembered, he invited me to dinner at the Park Central Hotel, and we sat talking for six hours. It was a big surprise to me. Rothstein told me quite frankly that he had picked me because I was ambitious and hungry. Rothstein hated Masseria, but had no problem with Italians generally, and soon had a deep interest in both Meyer and Lucky, 
financing their illicit schemes, giving them valuable advice, contacts, and socializing with them. Both younger men idolized Rothstein and not only adopted his business practices, but also started imitating his style, shopping at the same fashionable clothier as he did. This made sense because they were moving up in the world, just like they had with earlier rackets. They split up the balkanized Lower East Side, with Meyer typically supplying liquor to speakeasies running, run by Jews and Lucky supplying the Italian bars. They pooled their money when buying products and backed each other against mutual threats. By the mid-1920s, Meyer had purchased a car and truck rental operation based in the Lower East Side. Cars were a novel invention at this point, and the rental place brought in considerable legal profits. It was also a perfect cover for the fleet of cars and trucks Meyer and Lucky used to smuggle booze. Both men also expanded out the Lower East Side, maintaining safe houses in the old neighborhood, but spending most of their nights in high-end hotels and swanky neighborhoods. Lucky even bought a cottage in rural Nyack, New York, where the gang went for relaxation, and more importantly, firearms practice. This was a good idea, because by this time, Lucky wasn't the only one who was busting his gun. In 1924, Meyer's second-in-command, the notoriously violent Bugsy Siegel, got word that a Jewish associate of Rothstein, a gangster who went by Waxy Gordon, was secretly paying the anti-Semitic mob boss, Joe Masseria, to protect a load of liquor coming in from Atlantic City. This enraged Bugsy. While Bugsy and Meyer were generally cool with Lucky entering into mutually profitable deals with Masseria on equal footing, it was an entirely different story that Waxy, a fellow Jew, was bowing his head to a bigoted peasant like Masseria and paying him protection. Both Meyer and Bugsy had made their names as children for never getting extorted and didn't respect anyone who did, especially not Jews. The fact that Masseria was a personal enemy of Rothstein, a man who had helped every stand-up guy in New York, made the betrayal even worse. Bugsy told Meyer, who felt the same way, and they quickly got some guns and goons and headed towards New Jersey. They were going to teach the old Gavon a lesson and make some money doing it. Around three in the morning, the convoy of booze, driven by Masseria's goons, was rattling down a dark country lane when they came across a large tree felled over the road. As the Sicilians got out of the truck to examine the roadblock, Bugsy, Meyer, and about a dozen of their men came out of the forest, masked up and guns blazing. The hail of automatic gunfire cut down most of the Italians, and the rest quickly surrendered. The Jews, wanting to send a message, gave the survivors a brutal, humiliating beating and drove off with the valuable liquor. Possibly on purpose, Meyer showed the surviving Sicilians his face. It's possible he wanted Masseria to know that Jews had punked him. In any case, the enraged Masseria was unable to touch the Bugs and Meyer mob. They were clicked up with Lucky. and At this point, Masseria was too reliant on Lucky to run his business in southern Manhattan. However, this incident foreshadowed a rift between younger gangsters and Masseria's crew that would explode by the end of the decade. Regardless of the drama, Meyer and Lucky's association with Masseria and Rothstein was deeply profitable and educational for both men. From the, from the domineering Italian Masseria, they learned the importance of structure and tradition. And from the Jewish Rothstein, they learned the importance of flexibility, negotiation, and mutually beneficial deals. Neither Masseria nor Rothstein would survive prohibition. Perhaps surprisingly, the conciliatory Rothstein was the first to die. Rothstein was not killed by Italians or by upstart Jewish gangsters. Instead, it was his gambling habit that did him in. In fall 1928, Rothstein spent an entire night in a marathon gambling binge, wildly betting on stud poker, dice, and random card draws. By the end of the night, Rothstein was down $300,000, or about $4.5 million in today's money, and he was accusing his opponents of cheating, which was probably somewhat plausible. Due to this evidence of cheating, Rothstein procrastinated on paying his debt. This would cost him his life, and on November 4, 1928, an unknown gunman shot Rothstein in the gut outside the luxury hotel he lived in. Rothstein would cling to life for two days, but refused to implicate his attacker, 
telling investigators, you stick to your trade, I'll stick to mine. Finally, on November 6th, 1928, Arnold Rothstein, the great gray rat, mentor to a whole generation of mobsters, died. Joe Masseria was probably happy at the news. He would stick around into the 1930s, but his days too were numbered. Like it or not, he was going to be replaced by younger, more forward-thinking gangsters. At the beginning of the 1920s, Meyer and Lucky were glorified gangbangers, living in tenements, scraping by, and just getting their start in real organized crime. By the end of the decade, things had changed. They lived in swanky hotels, wore the finest suits, mixed with celebrities in high society, and were highly respected, powerful members of the Jewish and Italian criminal groups that controlled the seemingly unlimited profits of the illicit liquor trade. They were doing pretty well for a couple of immigrant kids from the hood. However, as the 20s turned to the 30s, ancient criminal groups from across the ocean eyed New York and wanted their piece of the bloodstained pie. The Castel Maurici had come to New York, and the bloodshed they would unleash would change the city and America forever.